Jesus. Actually, it's the wrong brother, Ricky. <laughs> so, uh, first thing we want to do, I'm going to put a basket at the end out there uh, for when church is open. We're going to take up a collection for Rick a watch. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, Brother Joel is, is starting a revival meeting tonight at his nephew's church, so uh, that's why, you know, he's not here tonight, and uh, so as we get started here, is there any prayer requests?
I'll pray here in a minute, and then uh, I think the Bennetts are going to come and sing for us, and then kids can go to Kids Blast, and we'll turn it over to Brother Ken, then let him, he's got the message tonight, so let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you, God, for another opportunity to be here. God, we thank you for the many blessings of life, and all the goodness and the greatness, God, that you bestow on each and every one of us, and Father, we pray as Brother Joel's there preaching tonight at his nephew's church. God, we just pray that you just anoint him with power on high. God, we just pray that, Heavenly Father, that that through this revival meeting, that, God, that there'll be many Christians that, that will be revived, God, that will rededicate their life, turn their life back to you, God, if they've gone away from you, and, God, if there's any there that's lost, and pray, Heavenly Father, they'll come to know your Savior. And God, we do lift up those that's, that we mentioned that needs prayer, God, that are sick, God, Thank you for the good report that she's being strengthened and, and getting better. But, God, we just pray that you continue to touch her. And, God, we just pray that you be with Brother Ken tonight. God, as he breaks the bread of life, God, we just pray that, Heavenly Father, you just hide him behind the cross. And, that God, that he's got the message that we all stand in need of. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm glad I'm saved tonight. Thankful for salvation. And this song, the words of it, has got more to look forward to or look for than we have behind us. And uh, old devil tries to get us to look behind sometimes, see our past, and bring that up. But thankful it's all under the blood, and we don't have to worry about that. We just got to worry about the future. Mountains cross rivers, 
desert places I've known. But I'm nearing the home shore, but I'm reading the rejoicing. Heaven's angels are singing, I've come to fortune above. Well, good evening. Good to see everyone out on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's been a beautiful day. I'm going to uh, continue with my line of thinking, a stormy night in a boat. This will be my third lesson that we've looked at. I just felt led that this is the way we needed to go. I know in, in life, all of us face storms. If I look about, None of us would deny that. We, we all face storms in life. I looked at the uh, disciples when Christ was asleep in the hinder part of the ship and the storm was raging. They, they, they thought he was going to let them die. They woke him up. He calmed the sea. Then the last lesson I looked at was Peter in the boat as a prisoner and the shipwreck and the storm that, that overtook them and, and what took place there. And, through, through Peter's vision, he, he saw that there would be no loss of life. All the cargo and the ship and everything was lost, but there was no loss of life. And tonight, I'm going to look once again as the disciples are in the boat, and I'm going to be looking at faith or sink. We can have faith, step out on faith, step out into the storm, or we can take our cri eyes off of Christ and sink into the storm, allow it to overtake us. That's what we're going to be looking at. We'll be looking in Matthew chapter 14. I'll be covering verses 22 through 33. I'm not going to ask you to stand the, the way I cover it verse by verse. You'd, you'd be standing for a while if we, if we did that, but let's, let's, we'll remember to respect God's Word. But we're, we're looking at this, this evening's lesson. Christ had just performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000 and other miracles. There was healings and different things going on as he was teaching. It came meal time, and they started looking at each other, and they said, well, the, the crowd is hungry. Do we have food? And they couldn't just run out to the drive through at McDonald's. McDonald's wouldn't be prepared for a crowd of 5,000 anyway. But they couldn't just run out to the McDonald's and grab food. This one little lad, we're all familiar with the miracle. He had five loaves and five fishes. Christ took that, blessed it, and through the miracle, fed the multitudes, all the people that were there, the men and the women and the children, they were, they were all fed. And after this, the, the people were demanding that Christ be set forth, that he be the king. They, they were pleased with what he was doing, and they wanted him to be the earthly king, to reign and to rule, to be a mighty political and, and a mighty power. It's what they expected and what they wanted. So Christ slipped off to the mountain to pray. When, when he was he was tired, he being man, he was tired in the flesh as he had stood and taught and as he had been among the throng of people and as he, as he was trying to get away from them and their demands, he went to the mountaintop to pray. And he told the disciples to get in the boat, to go across the water. Once again, he instructed them to get in the boat. He instructed them to go across. They got in the boat. They were going to run into a stormy sea. As, even as, as they probably hadn't anticipated that. But we, once again, we see that Christ had told them to do it. So we know that through him telling them that they indeed were going to make it to the other side. And sometimes when Christ has a, a calling for us, we may wonder when we face the storms of life, are we going to make it to the other side? But if Christ has instructed us to go, and we're trying to go as he is instructed, he will see that we make it to the other side. He will see that we accomplish that, that he has called us to do. 
just as we've looked at these lessons and, and saw how that Christ has came in, he's calmed the sea. And to, uh, this evening, once again, we're looking as Christ had went up to the mountaintop to pray. That's, we say Christ being God, why did he have to pray? Christ went to the Father to get instruction, to get consolation he, he, in, in the flesh. He, he went to God to ask for help. What does that show us to do? We need to go to God, our Heavenly Father. We need to go to Him and, and con commune with Him and, and ask Him to lead us, to give us strength, to guide us, to show us what He would have us to do. And that's what Christ was doing there. And His mission was for the disciples to continue on, and He was going to catch up with them. And we're beginning in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained His disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. So here the disciples were. They were on the high of having seen the miracle of the, all the people fed and seeing the healing that was going on and seeing the enthusiastic crowd. So the disciples here, they, they, they were excited. You and I, we get excited when we see good things, when we see Christ working, when he works in our life, when he accomplishes things in our life. And, when we see souls saved, when we things, see things going good, we get excited, just as the disciples were here. They, they were on a high, maybe. Christ, it tells us straightway, after this, after the feeding, and after the multitude was thronging around him and per trying to persuade him to take the throne, to be an earthly king, Christ told them. He, said, he sent the disciples, he said, constrained them to go to the ship, to go, to cross the sea, to go to, to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. He was going to handle the multitudes himself. He, he knew that the disciples still didn't fully understand his earthly mission. They fully didn't, un, didn't fully understand what he was going to do and that he was only on earth for a short time. So he sent them away that they might go on to the next area prepared to, to minister and to go about teaching and doing the works with Christ. So he, he sent them away even as he was going to deal with the multitudes. And verse 23, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. How great it is to be on the mountaintop alone with our Heavenly Father. That's a, that's a great picture, seeing Christ, the Son of God. What did he do? He, he was tired. He, he, was, he was trying to push the multitude away. And it tells us, after he sent the multitude away, we can imagine that after he had already instructed the disciples to get on the boat and to go ahead and cross the sea, this would have been a, a pretty heavy task to handle by himself, sending the multitude that's mulling around and demanding that he become king. They, they were trying to persuade him to do this. So th this would have been a, a, a heavy task for him to do alone. But the, after this, what did he do? He went up to the mountaintop to pray. How many times do we go to the mountaintop when we get thronged about. We get into confusion, people trying to persuade us to go in the other direction that we, than God's plan for us. Why don't we just go to the mountaintop alone and pray to our Heavenly Father that He would give us guidance, that He would give us consolation, that He would give us peace. That's what Christ did. He went alone. He didn't even have His disciples, those that He confided in, those that He worked with, those that, that witnessed the miracles, those that, that helped Christ. He went alone so that he might have fellowship with the Father apart by himself. He, he went to pray. And that's quite a good example for us. Once again, when we're thrown about with confusion and the masses of, of things that, that corrupt our life, we need to go to the mountaintop alone with our Father and commune with him. And that's exactly what Christ did. And it says, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now, verse 24 we see the progress of the disciples. They, they were out in, the, out in the sea. We've got to remember, most of these men were weathered fishermen. They'd been on the sea many times. And remember the first lesson I taught on the, the stormy sea at night? This is the same disciples that were in the boat. This is the same disciples that witnessed Christ to reach out and tell the waters to peace, be calm, be still. They witnessed the raging storm in sea that was overtaken, tossing the boat and overtaking the boat. They witnessed Christ's words to calm the sea and the calmness that they were able to float across on. Remember, these are the same men 
these weathered fishermen, these are the same men that had witnessed that. How many times after we go through a storm, we see the good things, and we, we're coasting along, we're going as Christ has commanded us to go. We're going in the, we're striving to go in the direction he has sent us in. We, we forget about those storms. We forget about how Christ comes in and has calmed the sea in our past. That's part of our testimony. That's part of our witness. Remembering the storms that we have been through. But what happens when we get out on the sea, wind starts blowing again, rocking the boat, the waves start lapping, and maybe the water starts seeping over the edges, and we begin to fear that the boat's going to fill up and that the boat might sink. How many times do we get out like that and we forget the calming of the sea that Christ has done in the past? So let's, let's remember, this is the boat that these men are in. We, we witnessed, we, we've read the account of how that Christ had calmed the sea, how that they'd been on the stormy sea before, and these being seasoned fishermen, no doubt, before that Christ came into their lives, they had, they had faced many, many stormy seas. So they, these men were, were weathered. You and I, we get weathered to the storms of life, and it's our prayer that we don't get beat down by them, but that we become stronger. These men, each storm that they went through, they learned that much more how to deal with the storm. And certainly once Christ came on the picture, they learned to trust in him to calm the storm. And that should be our desire. So we go through each storm that we learn better and better, more and more, how to handle the storms of life that comes about us. And that first and foremost, that we remember that we know the one that can calm the sea, the one that can make the peace be still, the one that can calm the confusion, the distresses of life that we face. So it, we tell us, it tells us that he went up to the mountaintop. He was there alone. Verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea. So here we go. Christ is on the mountaintop alone. And no doubt, he's had a mountaintop experience with the Heavenly Father. He's communed with him. He's got recharged. He's, he's received comfort and direction and, and peace. But while he's up there peacefully communing with the Father, the boat's out in the sea. And what's happening? We're looking at the stormy sea again. The winds are blowing boisterously, and the, she the, the boat's being tossed to and fro. It's just being tossed all about by the waves and the storm. It says, for the wind was contrary. The wind's been rather contrary the past few days around here. So we should be able to relate to that. Just imagine being in a little boat and the wind whipping even stronger than what we've been seeing the past few days in, in our weather. Remember, it rocking the boat, the waves lapping over the boat, and, and the men, as they were trying to row harder, maybe adjust the sails or whatever, with the tacking was there for the, for the trip. But it says the wind was contrary. Here the men are. Once again, Christ is he's on the mountaintop, and he, 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 know, he knows where they are. And it says, In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. So Christ, here he is. It's his desire to be on the other side with the disciples. That, that's his mission. That's his ministry. He sent them on over that they might go alone, that they, that they go together without him to go to the other side. And he was going to join them over there to continue his ministry, to continue his mission upon earth. So it tells us that Christ, he came down from this mountaintop experience. You know, that's what mountaintop experiences will do. When we go to the mountain alone and commune with our Father, we can walk on the sea, figuratively, but we, we can get peace, bolster, strength, direction. And that's the way Christ was. But Christ was literally walking on the sea. And one of the other Gospels tells us that Christ, he was just going to walk right on past the, the boat. He knew that the disciples were in God's hand. He knew that they were going to be safe. He knew that they were going to be on, arrive on the other side because he had told them to go to the other side. And that one of the other Gospels tells us that Christ was just going to walk right on past as, as he was going about. He, he knew that he would meet them over there. But here, here he is. He, even as they're on the sea, they're dealing with the contrary winds as the boat's being tossed to and fro. And once again, the, the seasoned sailors, they're beginning to question. They're beginning to do all that they know to do to keep the, the boat afloat and to keep everything going. But here Christ is. Imagine, they're out in this stormy sea. 
and it, it's stormy and windy, so that tells us there wouldn't have been much moonlight or starlight, just maybe just the eyes had become adjusted to the to the darkness, you can see just enough to to see a little bit of what was going on. And here it tells us that in the fourth, fourth watch of the night, near dawn, Christ comes walking up on the sea. We can imagine, he, he's just strolling along just like everything's normal, just like he's walking down the street. But yet he's walking on this stormy sea. We can picture it better if it was a, if it was a glass steel water and him walking on it. But this was a stormy sea. It's, uh, the contrary winds were tossing the boat. And here Christ is just strolling along and then going to the other side. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Okay, let's picture this. Here these seasoned men are, these fishermen. This ain't the first time they've been on a boat and the wind's contrary and tossing the boat about and wondering are they going to make it to the other side. This is not the first time. But just picture this. Here they see Christ come strolling up calmly on this boisterous sea. What happens? They get afraid. They, we know that the sailors, the old sailing lore was that those that had been lost at sea, that they haunt the sea. They, the, the ghost of them walk the seas at night. So that's the first thing that comes to their mind, that they're seeing a spirit, a ghost. When we get in troublesome seas, and Christ, God's hand tries to come upon the scene, do we get confused I like the disciples? Do we fear the very touch that God is bringing to us? They weren't expecting Christ to come walking up in the flesh, walking on the stormy sea. When we're, when we're in the midst of life storms, we don't always expect God to appear the way that he appears. We have it pictured in our mind. Well, the storm's just going to dry up. The sun's going to come out. Or the moon's going to come out. Everything's going to calm down and, and be okay. But sometimes God has a different plan. And sometimes it might scare us. You know, we look at it. We look at the disciples shaking our heads. Well, well, didn't they know Christ? Didn't they know that he was capable of walking on the sea? Remember, these men were already trembling with fear because the boat was being tossed about. They didn't know if they was going to make it to the other side or not. And then here Christ is. They'd never seen anybody walking on the sea. You and I have never seen anybody walking on the sea. We've seen some pretty talented people and surfboards and whatever, but literally walking on the sea. So this was something different. What happens when we're in the midst of a storm of life, the turmoil of life, the contrary winds are blowing us off track. The way that we thought we were going. The path that we thought we were following that God had us on. And the storms come in to waylay us, to pull us down. What happens when God comes in and answers in a way that we didn't expect? It scares us. We don't understand. Just like the disciples didn't understand. They didn't understand that what they were seeing. We may not always understand how God is answering. It may not be the answer that we expected. It may not be the answer that we really wanted. And it scares us. It, it confuses us when God answers like that. But what we need to do is, as we're going to see the disciples did here, we need to have faith. And that's what, that's what we're coming into. It says when they, when they saw Christ walking upon the sea, they were troubled. They didn't understand. Can't you just imagine? What is that? Did you see it? I thought I saw something. It's a ghost. It's a ghost. It's the hanks from those that have been lost at sea. Remember, these, these men, they, they had the fisherman's lore, the old tales that had been told throughout their career and throughout their lifetime. And that Yes, they were believers in Christ, but yet they were still persuaded by some of the old thinking or whatever. They didn't know what it was. They saw Christ, and their only thought was, is, it's a ghost. They didn't understand what was taking place. It's, they cried out, and they said, it's a spirit. They cried out for fear. They were afraid. So here it is. They were already afraid of the storm and already afraid of, their, of what was going to take place through the storm. And now here this unusual phenomenon is they were even 
more afraid. So what happens when we get afraid? When we get troubled, that is the time to reach out to Christ. But we see that they were, they were like us in verse 27. But, here's this but, meaning that there's a turn on the events. Something's changing. But straightway, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Let's read that again. Christ spoke out. These men were trembling. They were, they were fearful. They were probably past the point of common reasoning. They were, they were to already fearful to that extent. But Christ reaches out. Once again, I'm going to read it once again. and just, just think of the times that we think we have reached the end. We think there's no other way around. And then we start, we see things that are beginning to take place that we don't understand. It's not the answer that we expected. But just think, out of the midst of the storm, Christ speaks out to us, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Can we all say praise the Lord there? When we get in those storms, Christ reaches out. He told them. He realized. He, he saw the confusion, the consternation, the fear. They were trembling with fear. Christ saw this. He told them. He said, don't be afraid. Be of good cheer. Cheer up. Everything's okay. How do we handle that message when we're in the midst of the turmoil, the storms of life? Christ reaches out calmly and says, be of good cheer. Everything's going to be okay. The waves are boiling around us. The turmoil seems like the roof's caving in on us. We don't know what's next. We don't know how we're going to wake up and face the day tomorrow. But Christ speaks out. Be of good cheer. Cheer up. Everything's going to be okay. How hard is it for us to hear that message? It's very hard on my part. I think I've got it under control. Everything's okay. I'm scared. I don't know how I'm, how I'm going to handle it. But Christ speaks out. What we've got to do is listen. Step aside and listen. When Christ says, be not afraid, be of good cheer, listen to that message. And realize that that's the truth. That he does want us to be of good cheer. He wants us to look up. He's telling us we're going to be stronger when we get through the storm, when we get through the turmoils of life. He tells them, be not afraid. All right. Now we're going to look at Peter. Peter. We're all familiar with Peter. And you want to st shake your head and say, yeah, he's always sticking his foot in his mouth. Well, at least Peter opens his mouth. At least Peter is willing to step out. Peter is willing to speak up. Peter is willing to do something. The others were just sitting there quietly. They were still probably trembling with fear and beginning to assess what Christ had told them. But Peter here, he's human. We're human. Do we ever question God? Quick, short answer. No, I never would question God. Wait just a minute. Just think about some of the things we've been through. Do we ever question God? Before we start throwing darts at Peter, let's just think about that in my personal life, in your personal life. It's, it's too easy as humans to question God. Maybe not to question that God's on the scene, but why he's handling it the way he is. Why, why, where, the big question is, where was God when I needed him? He was walking in the sea beside us in the storm. He was there. He knew we was in the storm. He knows we're in the storm when we are. He's walking right beside us. Do you know something? Christ was in the same storm that the disciples were. He was just calmly strolling across the stormy seas, walking to the other side. But he knew what they were going through. Don't you realize? Don't I point the finger at me looking in the mirror. Don't I realize? Christ is in the storm with me when the boat's being shook about and, and I don't know if the boat's going to sink or float. Christ is right there. His words are, be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. But the human part of us speaks up as Peter did. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. 
Okay. Does that not sound like us? Is that you, Lord? Is that really you? You know, it could still be a ghost. This could not really be the real thing. So Peter asked him. Once again, and we're quick to, to question Peter's faith at this point in saying, if it be you. And then you say, well, maybe he's bargaining with God. He's saying, if, if it be you, tell me to walk on the water to come join you. Okay. Have we ever bargained with God? Quick short answer once again is no, I never would. Wait just a minute. Have we ever tried to bargain with God? Number one, you don't bargain with God. But no, number two, have we ever tried to bargain with God? Question God. Question what he's doing in our life. Question how we're to be used through this storm. How the, the technique, the way he's handling the storm. Have we ever questioned it? Peter was questioning him. He said, if thou be. That entails some doubt. Do we not have doubt when we don't understand how, how God is bringing us through the storm? We have doubt. We don't understand. That's not the answer I thought I was going to see. I thought the winds would just die down. The seas would calm. The stars would pop out. Everything would be calm and rosy. No, instead, here comes Christ strolling on the stormy seas that's still boisterously storming and scaring us. So many times, maybe God, once again, he, he calms the sea. He calms the storm in an unexpected way. And we might ask, God, is that you? That's not the way that you would answer this, is it? That sounds like something we would do. And that's what, exactly what Peter was doing. He said, if you're really Christ, tell me to walk out on the water. So, all right, we're quick to throw darts at Peter because he, he questioned Christ. Maybe you say he had a lack of faith by not believing that it was Christ. And, and then, he, then he wanted to bargain with Christ. If it is you, let me walk on the water. So, once again, how many times do we question God? How many times do we say, God, if you'll just do this, I'll believe. If you'll do that, I'll do this or that. We're trying to bargain with God. And we see that, that Peter here, was, he was that way. And Christ could have brushed, brushed him off. He could have rebuked him at this point. But a loving Christ understood the predicament that Peter was in. Once again, we're quick to try to condemn Peter for speaking up and questioning who Christ was. Where's the other disciples? I didn't hear them say anything. They were just quietly, meekly sitting there just to see what was going to take place. Well, at least Peter had the audacity to speak up and to ask God, Christ, is this you? If it is, prove it to us. We think it's a ghost. We've been afraid of, of, of what's taking place. All right, here we are. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. What was Christ's response? Once again, Christ could have rebuked him here for his, for his lack of faith or perhaps his disbelief. But Christ reached out with love. Understanding. Have we ever realized that when we get overwhelmed, when we question God, when we ask, where was God? God is always there. He reaches out lovingly. His command here to Peter, come. His command to us when we question, where was God? Come. I've been here all alone. I'm here ready to take your hand. I'm here ready to guide you over. But we see, I'm getting off track there. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Look at this. Peter here, he had a, a little bit of lapse of faith, but how much faith when Christ bid him come? Just a simple word. He didn't say, I'll hold you up, trust me. Christ just said, come. How many times does Christ tell us to simply come? How many times does it take faith for us to stick that foot out of the boat? Stick the second foot out of the boat, walk on the water. It takes a lot of faith when Christ tells us to come. And that's the way Peter was. Peter had that faith. Christ told him, come. 
Peter could have just held on to the boat and said, no, Lord, I can't walk on that water. Well, what did he do? He lifted one foot over the edge. He lifted the other foot over the edge as Christ had commanded him. And Peter was come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. This is a miracle. Peter had the faith. After questioning, after having a slight lapse of faith, he had the faith to follow Christ's command in the storm to, to, to go. And it tells us that Peter walked on the water, going toward Christ. How many times when we're in the storm and what we call upon Christ, we even may even question who he is, where he is, his means of answering the prayer and calming the storm. How many times do we call upon him? He tells us to come. We've never done it that way. Things are different. Things are going to be different if I go. But we've got to have that faith to step forward when Christ tells us to come, just as Peter did. And Christ will tell us to come, just as he did Peter. He tells us to come, to, to walk upon the water, not, not, maybe not literally, but it takes the same amount of faith that it took Peter to put that first foot down, and that second foot down, to stand on the sea. It takes the same amount of faith when Christ beckons us in the midst of the storm to come, we have to keep our eyes on Christ. We have to trust in Christ. So we, if we were throwing darts at Peter earlier for his lack of faith, maybe we give him many kudos here for his great faith in stepping out of the boat. But yet we're going to say Peter's human. You and I are human. We have those sea walking experiences just as Peter did. When we choose to follow Christ, when he tells us to come, we walk on the water. Things are good. And verse 30, remember, Peter's walking on the water. Christ is standing there. I can, I'm just imagining here, standing there with outstretched arm, telling Peter, come. Peter had the faith. He stepped out of the boat. He's walking on the water. The other disciples are sitting there with big eyes, watching, believing that truly this is God. This is Christ and God in the flesh. And here Peter's faith has allowed him to walk upon the water. And Peter, he's got his eyes on Christ. He's, he's walking toward him. Now, verse 30. Unfortunately, we've got another word, but. But. Things are going to change. Here Peter is. He's walking toward Christ. His faith is literally allowing him to walk upon the water. But when he saw the wind boisterous, what happened? He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. What happened? Peter was walking on water. Peter had great faith. He stepped out of the boat. This raging sea, it took much faith. But how quick did that faith wane? What happened? He took his eyes off of Jesus. The blowing storms, maybe a little salt water got in his eye. And he looked around. He saw the wind raging, the sea raging. He took his eyes off of Christ. What happened? He started sinking. What happens to us? When we're in the storms of life, Christ comes. He's walking on the sea beside us all the time, all alone. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we need. He's there. He beckons us. Come. We reach out through faith. We change our direction. We go as, as Christ has beckoned us to go. But what happens? All of a sudden, the confusion, the turmoil of life, it's still raging around us. I don't know how I'm going to pay that bill. Aunt Sally sure is sick. I'm going to lose my job next week. Just We take our eyes off of Christ. We put our eyes back on the storm. What happens? We begin to sink. Just as Peter did. It's, we're quick to 
we've had, maybe had three occasions to judge Peter here. First, maybe we judged him for having a lack of faith or questioning who God was and asking questions. Then we, then we, number two, we commended him for his faith, stepping, stepping out of the boat. And number three, we questioned why did he lose faith? Does that not sound like you and I? The cycles that we go through. We question God in the very turmoil, the very storm. He reaches out, he calms the storm. Everything's going smooth. What happens? We take the eyes off of Christ. We put them back on the turmoil, the confusion that life throws at us, and we start to sink. So it's, we need to be careful when we start judging Peter because we look in the mirror and we see it's a picture of the cycles that we go through as well. And that's, that, that gives us a good lesson. And it tells us that he started crying out. Peter started sinking. And he, he cried out, Lord, save me. What did Christ do? He pushed him down. No. What happens? Even during our lack of faith, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm sinking. The storm is overtaking me again. The turmoil of life. I saw the light. I had the faith. I had the water walking experience. But it's pulling me under, Lord. I'm drowning. And immediately, I'll do it when I... No. Immediately. Immediate response. Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? So what happened? Peter called upon Christ. Did Christ turn his head on him or did he say, I'll get to you when I have time? No, immediately. He reached out his hand, stretched his hand out. Come, my child. Did he chastise him? Yeah, he had a slight rebuke for him. But what about you and I? Did, would we have even had the faith to step out of the boat? We've got to remember, we're, we're quick as, as a society, we're quick to judge Peter for, for not having the faith to walk across the sea with Christ, for starting to sink. How many of us would have got out of the boat to start with? How many of the other disciples got out of the boat? Peter's the only one. And Christ, Christ reached out to him. Oh, thou of little faith. Wow, that sounds like he's calling me. Oh, thou of little faith. Does it sound like you? Many times, probably so. He called out to Peter. Oh, thou of little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? O oh, thou of little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? Why did we lose our faith? Why? Did we think the raging storm was going to pull us under when Christ had told us to walk across the sea when indeed we were walking across the sea? Where did our faith go? In our daily turmoils of life and the storms that we face, where does that faith go? Why do we start sinking? Why does Christ have to address us? Oh, thou of little faith. Sure enough, it sounds like him calling my name when, when you hear that. Because there's so many times my faith wanes when if I would just trust in God and allow Him to lead me through. He's always there. He's always got that outstretched hand. But we must remember and realize when Christ called, Lord, I'm sinking. Save me. Immediately, Christ reached out in love and lifted Him up. And so we see that what kind of testimony would, Christ, would Peter have after this? He can always remind people when I walked on the water, how many water walking experiences do we have that we can tell other people about how that, how that Christ miraculously led us through the storm and allowed us to walk on the water? What a testimony he had. Even when he had to say, but I took my Christ, eyes off of Christ and started to sink. Once again, how many people on that boat had that testimony that they were able to walk on the water, period? How is our testimony? The water walking experiences that we've had through life, are we able to reiterate them, to tell others about it? Is that part of our witness, how we went into the storm, through the storm, walked on the water when Christ said come? That should be our, our testimony, our witness, that we remember to tell others about that. In verse 32, 
And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. So when Christ and Peter got in the ship, imagine Christ holding Peter's hand. They stepped into the ship. What happened? Immediately. The sea calmed. I can just imagine the stars came out. The sea got glassy calm. Everything was peaceful. Just think. These disciples here, they went through quite a cycle. They saw the storm coming. They got in the boat to go across to the other side as Christ, Christ had commanded. The storm raged upon them. They, they, they were fearful of the storm itself. They saw Christ walking on the sea. Remember, he was in the midst of the same storm they were. He was there. He knew what they were going through. And, but we remember the experience that they were going through. And then, then as, even as... Peter went out through faith, stepped out on the sea, and the, the lack of faith, he started sinking. Christ reached out and, and lifted him up. And when they got in the boat, everything calmed down. That storm was another experience that they were able to add. And you and I were able to read it these centuries later and see the faith, see that Christ is with us through the storm. And so how, how do we reflect the storms that we go through? It's probably not going to be written in God's Word and be read centuries later, much as this is. But what about our daily witness, our daily testimony, to tell others about the storms that we've been through? Not giving credit to Satan, but just realizing in real life there's going to be that storm, that turmoil, that confusion, those times that we don't understand, those times of distress. It's always going to be upon us. But how do we handle it? Through our faith, we get through it. We might be on a different course than we were before the storm hit, but how do we handle it? Do we tell others uh, of our experience through our faith? That, that should be our desire, that we grow stronger through these storms, that we have a, a better testimony to tell others about it. Now closing in verse 33, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. So here these men are that thought it was a ghost that was walking upon the sea that was coming out of the storm. Here they are after the experience. They worshiped God and they proclaimed truthfully, this is God. This is the Son of God. God in the flesh. When we go through the storms, do we worship God? That should be our desire, to worship God. Think back on some of the storms that we've been through in life. Did we praise God for it? Did we thank God for leading us through? Did we give, give honor and glory to God for, for what he's brought us through? And do we truly believe to the extent that we tell others about the God that led us through that storm and, and how, he, how he led us through it? That should be our desire. As, as we close this evening, as I titled our message, Faith or Sink? Are we going to have the faith to keep our eyes on Christ during the storm to, to come as he commands us to come? Or are we going to take our eyes off of Christ, look back on the troubles and turmoil of the world, and start sinking? That's the question we need, each one need to ponder this evening as we close. Now let's close in prayer at this time. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to look in your word once again, Lord. Thank you, Lord, as we looked at another storm of life, God, as the disciples face. Pray, we thank you, Lord, that you are with us, God, through those storms, God. We pray, God, that each one of us individually would ponder this, God, and that we would ask ourselves, Lord, do we have that faith to keep our eyes centered on Christ? Do we realize that he's walking beside us through the storm? He knows exactly what we're going through, Lord. Help us, God, to realize that, God, and ponder it, God, and to, to trust in Christ, God. And when he beckons us to come through the storm, help us to have that faith to keep our eyes on him, God, to Follow him through, God, that we might not sink into the troubles and turmoil of the world, Lord. Pray that you'll just lead and guide. Pray, God, that you'll be those on the prayer list, those that are in need, touch, heal, and bless, Lord. And, God, we thank you and praise your name, God, for all of your rich blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.